Coming up on Digital Music Trends 198, recorded on the 27th of August 2014, SoundCloud unveils its premier partner program, Medium prepares a music magazine, my guests give us an update on Audium and the Tomahawk, then we chat about the gramophone, Denmark's recorded music revenues, the UK's plans to implement age ratings for music videos and lots more. This week's show is brought to you by Play MPE, providing secure music distribution and promotional services to the world's largest labels for over 10 years, with templates that dynamically integrate metadata, artwork, text, social media and video to deliver a rich multimedia experience to recipients. Find out more on plaympe.com. Hello everyone and welcome to Digital Music Trends, I'm Andrea Linelli and this is the weekly show where we talk about and try to make sense of the latest news in the digital music industry and Digital Music Trends is available on a variety of streaming services, many of which enable you to subscribe to the show, but if you are partial to being able to carry around a podcast with you, remember that you can download it for free if you get the podcast app for iOS, the Downcast app for iOS or Dog, ca- dog Catcher for Android, you can get the audio or the video version, whichever you prefer. And if you would like to receive a weekly mail out that lets you know uh, when the show is out and what we talk about each uh, what we talk about each week uh, you can sign up on bit.ly slash dmt list uh, and you'll find all the info there and uh, this week it's a real pleasure to welcome two great guests uh, uh, both from the east coast of the u.s uh, starting with uh, jay herskowitz a contributor to Hom- tomahawk industry consultant and co-founder of the as of yet stealth project uh, Hatch- hatchet industries so hi jay and thanks for joining me how's it going uh, it's going well. Great. Thanks for having me again. It's great to have you. And it's a real pleasure to welcome back uh, Jeff Price to the show after probably a, over a year, a founder and CEO of Audium. So hi, Jeff, and uh, how's it going? It's going well. Thanks for having me. It's a real pleasure to have you. And we're going to have plenty of time to talk about Audium later on in the show. Uh, but I wanted to start the conversation by talking about SoundCloud. And so the company has finally unveiled some of its plans around the future of the platform and uh, more specifically uh, its creator partner program, uh, simply called On SoundCloud. So the program will be for the first time available to creators uh, to start making money off the platform. And will it be initially available only to a small group of users? Uh, the company's uh, co founder, Alexander Leung, in an email to users as stated we're introducing advertising from select brand partners to SoundCloud when someone sees or hears an ad they are supporting an artist and the company's website gives a few more details uh, on what the premier partner level will involve uh, there's three things essentially involved uh, uh, more comprehensive more comprehensive stats a monetization option and access to a dedicated account manager and finally uh, premier partners will have access to exclu- exclusive opportunities to promote their music on SoundCloud so this uh, is great Great, and it's great news that we, we hear something about what's going on, but it's still pretty vague in the sense that we don't know what brands are involved, uh, uh, what kind of artists have been invited to test this feature out. Uh, uh, we don't know the rates SoundCloud is going to play uh, pay to, to artists uh, or the timeline for a wider rollout or whether the company has come to any agreement with the PROs at the moment. So uh, still a lot of question marks here. Uh, Jay, what do you make of this announcement? In, in, you know, uh, uh, of course, as I said, a lot of gaps to fill, but uh, overall, what are your thoughts? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think it was, um, you know, largely inevitable. I think, you know, most of us that watch this industry have been kind of expecting this for a while. And, you know, I think SoundCloud has made no secret of the fact that um, they consider themselves the YouTube of audio and have taken a very kind of YouTube approach to the way that they uh, scale their business, build their business, and then ultimately come back and monetize their business. So, right. um you know, that along with the, you know, when they introduced the new mobile apps that were much more focused on uh, kind of passive consumption and listening, that was kind of the first, uh, you know, showing of their hand that, hey, we need to create a better listening experience so we can monetize that listening experience. So so not at all unexpected. Uh, you know, I'm definitely interested in learning more about kind of what the details are, um, kind of to your point, how that stuff, you know, how the money is shared, whether you have to pay to be a premier partner yes, to then receive yeah. money so you're already giving up a cut right there because you have to pay for even the potential to receive which i'd love to learn more about how that kind of works uh and then ultimately maybe you're going to talk about it you know i'm always much more um intrigued about what's going to go on with the subscription service that they alluded to um and, and to me that's always kind of much more interesting than the ad supported stuff but yeah um but yeah not unexpected um it will be interesting to see how they convert yeah. uh you know compared to youtube yeah, absolutely. Uh, Jeff, what are your thoughts? Uh, you know, this is uh, something that apparently it's been tested in the U.S. only. Uh, I don't know if that's because of restrictions or, or why they chose to roll out uh, first in the U.S. But uh, uh, f- from your perspective, also given the company that you run, uh, how do you feel about this? 
Well, it's a, another technology company using copyrights to achieve a financial exit to benefit the investors and shareholders, and there's nothing wrong with that. Um, you know, it's be it Microsoft or Rhapsody or Beats or Google Play, you know, take your pick. It's, uh, it's a similar theme, right? It's a company using copyrights to achieve some form of financial exit to reward the initial investors. And again, there's nothing wrong with that. The United States is an interesting place to start because we have a compulsory license here. We're one of the few countries on the planet that have compulsory licenses in regards to the compositions, the lyrics and melody of a song, which can be a hornet's nest to have to deal with. Uh, so it makes it a lot easier to roll it out, and there's pre-existing templates on what the sound recording rights holders want in exchange for allowing their copyrights to be used. So yeah. they give up equity in their company to some of the uh, sound recording copyright holders. They've got a U.S. compulsory license that compels those entities that control lyrics and melodies to have to license to them, and they can get off and running here very, very quickly and easily. And with BMI and ASCAP and CSAC, the three performing rights organizations, uh, those are pretty uh, turnkey-esque deals that they can enter to in as well to get the thing launched and begin to suss it out. And remember, the goal for SoundCloud, once you take venture capital, you have to get an exit. Yeah. And, you're, you're, and there's only one of three ways to get an exit. You go out of business, you get sold, or you go public. So the goal of the company is one of those three things. The goal of the company is not to provide an ecosystem to the benefit of musicians around the world. Alex is a great guy, and I know him, and I like him. But once you take venture capital, your, your philosophy, as you may be aware of the, where I stand and, uh, and what happened with my career, your philosophy is irrelevant. Venture capital wants a return on investment, and the music is a commodity to be used in any way whatsoever in order to achieve that exit, even at the expense of the rights holders. Yeah, uh, Jay, that, that was interesting that you mentioned a uh, subscription service and, uh, and you know, to bring in what Jeff was mentioning about venture capital exits, uh, one of the things that strikes me is how fast things can move from here onwards because uh, uh, SoundCloud had tried to uh, launch or had experimented with some advertising base options uh, back in March of last year, uh, so, uh, you know, uh, 17, 18 months ago, uh, where they had uh, images of brands uh, uh, as the background of the of the WAV file, essentially, uh, of the wave uh, on SoundCloud, and and that kind of stayed pretty quiet. And and perhaps it's been reworked in some of the offerings that they are coming uh, coming up with uh, this week. Uh, but I was wondering, you know, it seems like the rollout is not, you know, given the little information that we get, is still in a sort of a beta phase. Uh, you know, how how fast do you think SoundCloud has to move to be able to grab a piece of the market at this point, given that we have so many competitors in the streaming space? Yeah, um, I mean, it's a good question. And, and, you know, a lot of people are asking the question, why would they even announce that they were looking at subscription this early? And I think, you know, the only reason I can come up with is that they're trying, from a PR perspective, trying to stay part of the conversation when YouTube announces. And, and you know, obviously all the leaks have happened with YouTube. I, I got to imagine, I mean, I was betting that the official announcement was going to come sooner rather than later due to all the leaks. Yeah. Um, so I was thinking that it was going to happen this week. Everyone's, you know, people smarter than me have said, well, no, this is a terrible time to announce anything. So, but I mean, I do think that YouTube probably wants to preempt well, Apple's announcement or at least come in right after, you know, wants to be within that range around iPhone 6 announcement and whatever is going to be tied in with Beats and whether there's yeah. going to be a bundle with Beats with iPhone 6. Or, so I think that YouTube wants to try to work around that. And, uh, and then I think that SoundCloud wants to be part of that conversation as well. So, I think it's just all about how you time the, the announcement and stay relevant because you guys know as well as I do that in this space, you know, the average consumer or reporter really only has the ability to name like two subscription services at a time. Yeah. You know, it's Spotify and somebody else. Oh. Um, and so everyone's trying to like level up. Sorry, well, remember this as well. Jay's, Jay's right. It's a timing issue too. Think about what just occurred in the market. Songzo was just acquired for, you know, a hell of a lot more than they're probably worth. Right, Beats was just acquired for you know north of a billion dollars, and the rumor has it because of the interactive subscription service. So right now you kind of have a, a frothy frenzy of the valuation of companies that provide interactive streaming service. And to SoundCloud's uh, the benefit, and they they handle things really well. They have a user base of 170 million plus users. They've got a lot of legitimate music up there, unlike Groove Shark, which to me is a pariah and needs to be taken out. They actually began by serving the, uh, the artists themselves with some cool features and, and tool sets and build it very incrementally over time. So when you take a pre-aggregated consumer base of 170 plus million 
combined with tens of millions of pre-existing tracks, including exclusivity, along with a hundred million plus venture capital at a time where there's a, a frenzy in the market over interactive streaming, particularly with Apple, Apple's acquisition of Beats, it's, it's a great time to do the announcement because remember what they want to keep doing is what Spotify is doing is raise their valuation, raise their valuation, raise their valuation. Sure. Sure, absolutely. And, and we'll also, we'll, we'll keep an eye on the story that uh, was posted uh, uh, by Hypebot, uh, where uh, A2IM, the American Association of Independent Music, uh, posted that uh, they were essentially uh, warning musicians to uh, you know, make sure that they double check uh, the terms and conditions on SoundCloud when they upload music, because uh, according to their reading of uh, uh, the terms, uh, um, SoundCloud through the API, if musicians, uh, uh, if uh, artists give uh, SoundCloud access to, uh, you know, the, the ability to distribute their music via the API, then that means that uh, that content that's distribu distributed uh, essentially is royalty free. And that may actually in also involve internet radio stations, remix services and other music apps that access the service via the API. So uh, A2IM here was saying essentially make sure that you uncheck uh, or uh, turn, turn off the API access, which of course is a problem in itself because a lot of the services that uh, uh, access to the uh, SoundCloud API provide a great service to uh, to music discovery and to, music, uh, to users that want to find more music. So we'll have to see how that shakes out, whether it's just a misunderstanding or uh, if SoundCloud is going to clarify those terms and conditions. Well, the, I think the, the bigger problem is this, is that the major copyright holders, which are the major labels and major publishers, either receive very large advances or equity positions in the company. So it quells any concerns they might have in regards to this because they, they've reached a way to realize the benefit of what they have. Whereas sort of the diaspora of the independent musician that controls their copyrights, I mean, as I blab on about this stuff, it's boring, it's mundane, it's archaic, it's opaque, and nobody understands this crap. And who the hell reads the terms and conditions on a website? You saw the South Park episode <laughs> where they're taped to each yeah. other's butts. So, I mean, the problem is that the stakeholders that would understand these issues have reached a deal which satisfies their needs, either in equity or in advance. But for the diaspora of everybody else, they have absolutely no understanding of what the hell they're signing, which isn't their fault because it's complicated. And who reads the terms and conditions anyway? Yeah. And uh, Jay, from, from your perspective uh, as a developer, uh, the final thing on this is how do you see, would it be possible to lock the access to the API in a certain way so that, uh, you know, when the license is coming to play, uh, you know, we know that a lot of developers access SoundCloud's API and do all sorts of wonderful stuff with it. H how could that change in the future? Uh, I mean, there are settings, I mean, you know, to A2M's point, there are settings in there where you can say, don't make my content available via the API. So, yeah. um, you know, certainly people do that. A lot of the, you know, pre-release promotion stuff, they want to make sure that it's only available through the embedded widget, yeah. um, which is cool, and some people do that. Um, you know, I think to your point, though, there are a lot of uh, great, interesting apps and experiences that are, from a discovery perspective, that are helping um, those that are available through the API that may yeah. not be helping those that that are that are not so yeah. it's a choice you know certainly it's a choice and, and everybody has their own kind of uh, ends that they're trying to reach and so for some people I think they'll take advantage of that I think a lot of uh, of artists and labels will continue to make that stuff available because you do get the benefit of this really diverse ecosystem of of apps that are leveraging it and you know uh, uh, you know Tom Hawk is, is one of those ones that that does that so yeah you know I, I like to see stuff available via the API if somebody doesn't want to make it available via the API you know cool um, you know, it's not it's not for me to it's not for me to choose or decide. But uh, you know, certainly I've got a vested interest that I hope that stuff is more discoverable and more easily playable than not. Yeah. But you, you know, um, I'm not the artist, so it's not my decision. Absolutely. And we, by the way, we we too do plug into the API as well. It's it's a very great tool to allow for sort of an easy transfer of a music file from point A to point B. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and, uh, yeah, we're going to keep uh, watching the story. Of course, as I said, we don't have a lot to work with uh, in terms of uh, information this week, so we're going to have to wait and see as more information rolls in and as we see more examples being well, posted of, of advertising. So here's a, little, here's a little additional nugget, which is that in the United States, they have to pay copyright holders for the compositions right. on the 20th of the month for the previous month. So none of the digital music services, aside from Google, want to deal with that. So they all outsource it. And right. um, they will be outsourcing it to a company called Music Reports Incorporated to provide that service for them. And the challenge with that is what happens is the usage log is given by the digital music service, in this case SoundCloud, to an entity like a Music Reports or an HFA or a MediaNet. These are the companies yep. that provide the service. They then have to do what's called a, a mapping and a matching exercise where they take this usage log, which is a stream of every single sound recording, and I have to say, who is the, what is the composition that is attached to the sound recording? So you can have multiple songs called Let It Be. Right? So you've got to figure out 
which version of Let It Be it attaches to. Then once you get it attached to the composition, you have to attach the composition to a publisher. Yeah. And then once you attach it to the publisher, you have to know their name, address, and phone number and a way to pay them. So what happens is each month on these usage logs, on the first pass when these companies go through it, they're only able to match 60 to 65%. Right? That means that 35% of the revenue is still never matched or paid out. This has been going on for 12 years, by the way. Then you do the iterations. If you're lucky on your best day, you can get your match rate up to 85 90%. So for the, since the launch of Rhapsody 12 years ago, every single month, somewhere between 15 to 30 percent of the revenue that has been generated and is owed out doesn't get paid out. And what concerns me about SoundCloud is, you know, here's a, a very wide diaspora, including the independent artist uh, who writes their own lyrics and melodies and controls the second copyright, and yet they're not going to get potentially the second part of the money that they're owed from the use of their music because there is no technology solution. So it's great in, in, in one way. But the market needs a solution to make sure everyone gets paid accurately and on time. Absolutely, absolutely. And uh, I wanted to move on to talk about something completely different uh, and then talk about uh, sort of the, the uh, supposed death of print and, and how that's translating into online content curation for, for written content. So, uh, you know, of course, uh, print magazines are not doing very well, but we've seen iterations like, for example, the Shuffler FM iPad app Pause, which is a fantastic example of how content can be reinvented to fit the digital space uh, on, on the iPad in this case. And now Medium is reportedly setting its sight on curating a music magazine, as reported by Peter Kafka at Record. And uh, Medium, of course, is a personalized uh, blogging site and recently closed a 25 million Series A round. And the company is already working on a variety of verticals, including tech and sports, and also recently launched a magazine called matter. Uh, the music magazine will be edited by Jonathan Schechter, uh, co-founder of The Source, and he will be working with a variety of uh, uh, high-profile music writers. So everybody's talking about curation. And so how do you feel about curated online propositions when it comes to written content on music? And, and, and do you think that Medium ha has something here? But at the same time, you know, what is its goal? Because of course, uh, it probably is not going to make money on the content. So uh, uh, Jay, do you have any, any thoughts on, on that? And how you'd like to consume, uh, you know, information about music? Um, yeah, you know, I'm probably not the best person to ask because I am—I've never been really a long-form music uh, editorial reader. reader. Right. Yeah, um, and I think maybe I don't have the attention span, but it's probably worse now than it used to be. Uh, <laughs> and I blame Twitter. Uh, but you know, so so you know, if I see—I mean, this is terrible. But if if I uh, I follow a link into an article, and if I see that scroll bar get really small. Yeah, I was like, oh, I don't have time for this. Um, so uh, yeah, I'm I'm not the right audience for it. Um, <laughs> so so I probably don't have too many uh, kind of profound thoughts on it. Yeah, uh, sure. Uh, other than I think long form in general is probably a hard proposition. Yeah, uh, yeah absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I, I found that there was a uh, forget the name of the startup, but there is a company that is providing an amazing way to. Uh, edit long form content to add photos and all sorts of stuff on there uh, so that you can do some interesting things around uh, uh, around uh, content and uh, uh, but I can't remember the name of it uh, uh, Jeff on your side uh, how do you feel about this uh, uh, potential uh, for um, you know new online music curation and do you think there's any way to make money out of that or is it just going to be an exercise for Medium to raise its valuation essentially um you know, I, I'm with Jay, man. I, when it comes to music magazines, I, I would never read long articles. Uh, right. I, you know, I, I save my reading of long articles. I mean, there's only so much to write about. Yeah. This song is really good. Uh, <laughs> if you want to get into it, you, writing about the person or, or an event or something that they've done, yeah. I find it fascinating. I find podcasting, there's one where they deconstruct how artists put together songs. I find that absolutely fascinating, and that goes on for 20 to 30 minutes, so you can certainly yeah. capture my attention. But on the flip side, look, the Huffington Post is, you know, a perfect example of a of a site that became a magazine that's a blog and is, is basically a, a jump link thing with creating their own content. Worked yeah. really well, didn't it? And Crack, for those of you that don't know Cracked.com, man, I am just addicted to that site because all I do is make lists. Yeah. And that's great short form reading. But, you know, frankly for me, I I don't want to go and to long form reading content about music. I think it's easier just to click play and listen. Yeah. And, and uh, I, yeah, I know people have very different uh, views on that. I know people that absolutely love reading long form uh, articles on musicians, artists, releases, or all sorts of things. Even long reviews, uh, they love that kind of stuff. Uh, I am probably with you guys in the sense that I don't read uh, too many long form things on uh, around music. But uh, I'm interested in seeing how this is going to be organized. Because, of course, Pause, uh, for example, doesn't have 
real long form articles uh, it just has really good articles that are fairly well it uh, you know uh, well digestible and so i want to see how I that just wanna, but i just want to listen to music right i mean yeah. when it long i don't want to it's just like reading about food when i'm hungry i mean i just want to <laughs> eat the damn stuff so <laughs> i'd rather just be able you know hey this sounds like the beatles meet the rolling stones oh interesting click you know that that i find very useful yeah i, I think just in general um I always recognize my relationship with music has changed where I used to go deep on specific artists. Uh, now I go very shallow but very wide. Yeah. So, you know, I may hear, and unfortunately it leads to this kind of what have you done for me lately. I might have an album, uh, and I'm old so I like albums. I may have an album that I love, and then I don't even listen to the next album. Yeah. Um, just because there's so much else to listen to and so much to listen to and it's so easy to get to. So, so yeah, I, I, I dive much shallower, um, but I go kind of much greater distances. So if it gets to like, here's, you know, a 2000 word article on whoever, <laughs> um, I, I just don't know if I'm that invested, honestly. Yeah, I mean, actually, I found I found it fascinating this morning because uh, last night I was at the Kate Bush, uh, uh, her first gig in 35 years. And uh, obviously there was, you know, hundreds of articles written on this by people, whether they were there or weren't there. There was so much content to delve through. And uh, yeah, it was kind of interesting to see the long form pieces that may have been maybe like, you know, a thousand five hundred words on the uh, on the gig itself, uh, I guess, really resonated with people that couldn't be there. So in that sense, I really understand it if people want to know more about an event or something that they are not able to participate in uh in that sense the long form music writing really takes uh, takes a form of its own and uh, it was quite interesting to, to read all, everybody's opinion on that it, it was pretty amazing actually by the way if anybody's uh, interested oh, in nice. listening uh, i had no idea that's kind of cool i didn't know it had been 30 years to 35 yeah she only did one tour ever it was a six-week tour and then she disappeared off the scene cool. so uh, <laughs> It was uh, definitely interesting. I mean, I, I, I half expected her to, tr to run off once she saw the audience, but no, she, she seemed to pull through, so that was, uh, was pretty cool. And, uh, uh, and uh, actually, Jeff, uh, I wanted to ask you about Audium. Of course, uh, 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 that's uh, a company that we covered a little bit on the show last year. Uh, we did a, a long-form interview on the podcast that actually got picked up quite a bit. Uh, so, you know, 15, 16 months later, you know, you closed uh, uh, a 2 million round of funding with an incredible list of investors who Im I would imagine also act as a great uh, uh, brain trust for the company and you keep adding cl uh, a ton of clients, uh, you, you know, you're branching out into all sorts of different fields. And so what's your roadmap for the next few months and, and what's getting you excited uh, today? So you hit the nail on the head in regards to the funding. Uh, I learned the hard way about institutional venture capital with TuneCore. Right. And uh, over two years ago, the institutional VC pushed out all the original founders and investors. And I've just been, you know, uh, watching it's like watching a train wreck in slow motion. Um, <laughs> so this time around, yeah, Jimmy Buffett owns a piece of Audium. Jason Mraz owns a piece of Audium. Mark Geiger, the head of William Morris Endeavors uh, Music Group, owns a piece of Audium, et cetera, et cetera. And I wanted to keep institutional VC out. And my goal is to get copyright holders paid for the digital use of their music. I mean, that's really it. And I started with YouTube. And the reason we started with YouTube is because I felt no one was doing it right. And, and I was right. Um, YouTube is about copyright. It's complicated. But there's ways to deal with the system to clean it up and allow pipelines to flow. So now, you know, we represent and work for Trent Reznor, Nine Inch Nails, Dolly Parton, Ruthless Records, Tom Waits. Oh, Christ, uh, the whole Red Hot Chili Peppers catalog, uh, sort of Jason Mraz catalog, uh, Blue Water Music Publishing, the largest independent music publisher in the world, Amacham. So we Pink Floyd, Genesis, Rodgers and Hammerstein, Daft Punk. I mean, it's sort of the who's who. And I'm neutral in the market. In other words, I'm not a music publisher. I'm not a publishing administrator. That's who I work for. And in some ways, I'm a technology solution for all the horrible stuff. Yeah. Because when you go into YouTube... People think the trick to YouTube is finding the videos. Yeah, you got to do that. But the trick to YouTube, the real trick to YouTube is the data. The data is so messed up. And the reason it's so messed up is because the music industry is sex, drugs, and rock and roll. And for the people like me who had no talent and ran a record label for 20 years, I would stand next to the people that had the talent so I could hopefully get some of the bleed off of the sex, drugs, or rock and roll, right? Because uh, I didn't have the talent to do it. And you move to something like a YouTube or an Apple or a Microsoft or an Amazon or even a Spotify. These are technology companies. And they created non-relational, big data, NoSQL databases and cloud-based environments laced with business logic. And if that sentence didn't bore you, it should have. So the problem is you take sex, drugs, and rock and roll and you put them into a technology environment and they just they don't talk the same language. And the data that gets put into the databases is so bad and so wrong 
that it causes money not to get paid out and it causes the wrong people to get paid out and the problems that exist in YouTube's database were created by the music industry. Right? We loaded right. the stuff in to the point yeah. where if you watch a video and Michael Jackson is performing Billie Jean, for a while there, the music publisher for Pump Up the Jam was getting paid every time a Billie Jean video was getting watched. Or if you heard Bing Crosby crooning White Christmas, Eric Clapton's publisher was getting paid for the composition White Room for his band Cream. Right? It's just, just bad data. Yeah. And these bad data problems don't just exist in YouTube. If they exist in YouTube, they exist everywhere else as well. And this is what's clogging up this industry and not allowing people to get paid. And that's the problem I'm looking to fix. So, so we started I guess, with you. So I guess for you guys, like when you got a new catalog of all the artists you mentioned before, uh, uh, you know, you, the first thing you would do is look at the data and make sure that the data pro propagates correctly across YouTube. Well, here's part of the challenge, right? There is no way to go and check. The, where do you go? There's no global database yeah. that shows you who controls what. So We're hoping that, there will be one. But. <laughs> yeah, right. But, but there isn't. And... I'm about as unsexy as you can get in the music industry. And what I do is I scrub and clean data for everyone, and I go into these morass databases, and I just clean the shit out of them. <laughs> and we just build technology to do it. For example, if you go to uh, iTunes or RDO or Microsoft, and you do a search for a sound recording, you get search results with a list of all the sound recordings, right? And each one of those sound recordings in a database has to be attached to a composition. If right. they're not attached, the money can't flow. So if a kid covers Let It Be and goes to TuneCore or CD Baby and uploads it and it gets delivered into Spotify, how does Spotify know that that sound recording of Let It Be is the Lennon-McCartney Let It Be? There's no identifier, right? A database has used numbers to, to relate things together. Nobody knows the numbers. There's no uniformity. The, the information varies from place to place. So you just get these ridiculous data dumps and just clogs up the thing. So yeah. to your point, yeah, what we do is like send me what you got, however you got it. And then we embark using technology and just copyright stuff and, and finding out all the information. And we sort of put it together and then we can deliver it into the database of that third party. And then what we do is we police it. And when you find more sound recordings, we found ways to do that. You update databases. Now, part of the problem I have is I can go into YouTube and I, they've created a wonderful technology where I can throw the baseball and they can catch it. And what I mean by that is if I find new sound recordings of the Red Hot Chili Peppers, uh, Danny California, next month. Sure, yeah. I can put that information into my database and automatically push it over to YouTube and update it. And lo and behold, that allows the two to connect and then it releases money. No other digital music service has that. So let's go to SoundCloud or let's go to uh, um, the RDO. If I find another 220 Jason Mraz compositions for I'm Yours, I have no way to deliver that updated information to these companies so the arrears money can't get released and it doesn't right. connect it going forward. They don't have the infrastructure. I mean, this whole thing is such a global mess. So yeah, what Audium does is it, it fixes the mess. Awesome. It fixes it for digital music services and it fixes it for copyright holders. I'm a technology solution. I'm not a publisher or publishing administrator. That's who I work for. <laughs> Great, and uh, I would I would recommend people to go and check out audion.com as well to get more information on the company. And uh, uh, you know, definitely a field that is going to evolve a lot in the next two or three years. So it's uh, one that uh, it was a a good call to get involved in uh, relatively early. And and Jay, on, on your front, uh, uh, anything you can tell us on your stealth startup? Probably not. Uh, anything on the Tomahawk front that you want to talk about? Uh, yeah. So Tomahawk, um, you know, we've talked about it a, a bunch of times. Uh, and the one thing I always kind of said is, yeah, we uh, functionally. We're very happy with where it was from an aesthetic and design perspective. We always knew that one day we were going to make it look pretty. Yeah. Uh, but the good news is that it's coming. Ooh. Um, so we were able to, you know, the, the big challenge with open source uh, projects is um, trying to get work done without paying any money because there's no money to pay. Um, but we were lucky enough that uh, uh, we found this great designer. He actually found us, ex-Apple designer, now Google designer, um, that is uh, giving us some really uh, well thought out, elegant kind of design solutions for Tom Ock. So nice. we're implementing that right now, and and uh, we are pushing forward with this next release, which hopefully should be, um, you know, in the next few weeks. Um, and uh, and we think that what really will Tom help Hawk kind of do? take. What's that? What does Tomahawk do? Uh, so Tomahawk is what we say, um, probably not the best kind of way to describe it. Is a multi source music player. So it's got plugins for basically all of your streaming services, all of your uh, local storage, all of your network storage, all of your cloud storage, and we'll just aggregate and play um, all of your music from whatever the best source is for each individual user. So it basically decouples the metadata from the source and then finds the best available source for each person. 
So one is it enables you to aggregate kind of all of your music across all of the different silos that you may have it. Um, but B, and more importantly, is that because of the way it works, it helps create this interoperability layer between users who may use particularly different streaming services. Um, and so the analogy I was working on the other day is, imagine if your desktop, you know, uh, a mail app, like the new mailbox app, imagine if that could only read and open emails that were sent by other mailbox users. Um, that's the state of music in the social environment today, in that there's no ability for users to interact across music services and across silos. Uh, Tomahawk solves that um, by fundamentally taking a different approach on how we, uh, how we resolve music. And so basically, this is content resolution for each user. Um, so if you're a Spotify subscriber, great. I send you a song. For you, it's going to play from Spotify. For me, it's going to play from Ardio. From Andrea, it's going to play from, from Deezer. Um, that's kind of the big goal that we're looking to uh, – that's the big problem that we're looking to solve from a, from a kind of unsexy, uh, under-the-hood um, relational – you know, how, how you establish those relationships across the services from a consumer perspective. That's awesome, man. I, I love Tomahawk, so definitely go and check out uh, Tomahawk on Twitter or uh, just Google it and you'll find the site. It's tomahawkplayer.com, right? It's uh, gettomahawk.com. Oh, get Tomahawk. Get I always forget that. Gettomahawk.com and, and you'll find everything there. And uh, I wanted to move on to talk about a few more news that uh, were uh, in the headlines this week. Uh, nothing major happening. It's just a few little things to uh, to talk about. Uh, Vivo, uh, you know, but last week we talked about it extensively, so I don't want to uh, go on about it too much. But I just wanted to give you an update on the fact that uh, the New York Post, uh, just a few hours after we finished recording the show last week, actually uh, reported that the sale is supposedly off. Uh, apparently the owners which are Universal Music, Sony Music, Google and uh, the Dabu, uh, Abu Dhabi Media Group decided that the rapid growth in the video space means that the company is probably going to get more valuable and so it doesn't make much sense to sell it. Obviously that's the official line uh, reported by the New York Post uh, sources. Uh, uh, there's also the unofficial line which was from the articles that we'd read in the previous few weeks uh, uh, talking about uh, dif difficulties in establishing a sort of a licensing uh, ecosystem that made sense for a buyer in the sense that that really affected the valuation, the fact that a lot of the licenses had to come from the sellers and, and they had to sort of guarantee whether those were going to continue in the, in the future or not. Uh, actually, if you want to know more about uh, Vivo, I interviewed Nick Jones, uh, the v VP of International of uh, the company, for the one-to-one -one show in Cologne on uh, Friday. And so you'll find that show also on digitalmusictrans.com and clicking through to the links uh, to the one-to-one -one show. Uh, I don't know if, Jeff, you have anything to say on Vivo or, or you know, uh, whether this was <laughs> just a... a the wrong time to try and sell the company or whether they actually did realize that this was a, a too valuable of an asset to sell? Well, I can't, I don't know the answer to that, but I do know what I, what I hear, which is music publishers in particular are confused over the use of their compositions in videos that are being monetized on video in regards to whether or not that's legal. So what I mean by that is let's take I Will Always Love You, right? Um, Sony Records hired Whitney Houston to perform it and they made, made a music video. So the music video actually has, I'm going to do this boring copyright crap again, has three copyrights to it. It has one for the video itself, it has one for the recording of the song, which Sony Records controls, and it has a third one for the person who wrote the lyric and melody. In this case, it's Dolly Parton, because she wrote I Will Always Love You about the husband she divorced in the 70s. So the question is, when they made that music video, and God, what year did that thing come out? 1989, 1991, whatever it was, did Dolly Parton grant to Sony Music a license to synchronize her lyric and melody to a moving image and then allow that to be commercially exploited in the way it's being exploited on Vivo, where they can throw ads up against it and make money. Right. And I'm willing to bet no. In which case, that music, if that's the case, and I don't know, but if that's the case, that means that Sony, in taking the official music video, which was supposed to go to MTV for promotional use only, uh, which could have potentially been exploited commercially, was this ever predicated in the agreement? And if so, what's the royalty or did the publisher agree hey you don't have to pay me anything you can just keep it all and that's for basically every video that's ever been made from the beginning of MTV up <laughs> until a certain time when legal contracts were changed so um, that's sort of the drumbeat I hear where people are trying to figure out hey people don't even understand what the hell Vivo is or how it monetizes or what the copyrights are and realizing that there's a Vivo.com right yeah, and yeah. Vivo also went to YouTube and created its own account its own channel called the Vivo channel. Yeah, sure. Right? So, and it, what these are and how this, so that may have had something to do with it. Yeah. Uh, Jay, on, on your side, you know, uh, did, do you have Vivo in, in, in Tomahawk? Do you have any video, video services on there? Uh, and, no, uh, no video services in there. Um, yeah, no, I, I mean, I think Vivo, the, you know me, I love to kind of 
swirl up conspiracy theories, but um, just this Amazon purchase of Twitch uh, and a tweet by David Pakman earlier today about how uh, game videos and music videos account for like, I don't know, 30 to 40 percent of all videos. And to me, I was like, God, wouldn't that be interesting if Amazon all of a sudden popped back up and said, hey, I'm interested in Vivo, I'm interested in Twitch, yeah. and maybe I'm interested in Hulu. Um, that, to me, would be like an atomic bomb going off in kind of the media and content business. I've got no indication that anybody is just considering that at all, but I'm like, yeah. God, would, wouldn't that be fascinating um, if it happened? Um, I mean, the problem is that, right, uh, Jay, like the problem, I guess, is that the people that want to buy uh, Vivo are probably the same people that uh, the, the majors are in hard negotiations with around licenses yeah. already. And so that's, that's a problem, right? Because they're the only people that have the money to buy it. Yeah, for sure. You've got, you've got to sell to somebody that already has licenses, or already has those relationships, because we know in any sale of any kind of licensed music service, those licenses don't convey. And so if you wanted yeah. to come in and like buy something and then renegotiate that stuff, that's a nightmare. So yeah, I think it has to be kind of looped into an overall negotiation with somebody that you're already working on those deals with. Yeah. Um, which, you know, Amazon's kind of in that in that boat, um, which is kind of what me got, got me thinking about it. But, uh, yeah. you know, that's just pure, like, you know... <laughs> speculation like, yes that's so, good it's it's pure, yeah, speculation. that's why we have a podcast right <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> if we can't if we can't throw wild conspiracy theories around then <laughs> what are we right. here for right. uh, and i <laughs> just want to talk briefly about uh, this little box here i don't know if uh, anybody can see it uh, i got it this week it was a it's a gramophone uh, by fon i uh, i came to know about it back in uh, march uh, it was presented by martin varsavsky uh, the, the founder of fon uh, which is the uh, sort of the small router that also created a, a massive network of Wi-Fi points around the world, uh, it, he kickstarted it. Uh, you know, raised over 300 grand uh, to uh, sell uh, you know a few thousands of these little boxes, and it's uh, it's like a. a audio streaming box if you haven't heard about this essentially it's got a, an audio out here an ethernet port and a powerpoint it's very simple uh, <laughs> it uh, creates a separate wi-fi point in your home which is pretty cool because it can be accessed by your friends as well if they are your friends on facebook they can just log into facebook and access it without any passwords and uh, it also allows you to control uh, spotify i think it's the first integration that they have and it works pretty well it kind of bounces the stream over to uh the box uh, a little bit like um, um, a few other things do so it's not it's not a bluetooth connection or anything like that it actually streams from the box and uh, yeah it's cool i mean the only thing i would say is that you have to connect your phone to the wi-fi network that the box creates so that's a little bit of a pain to be honest because uh, you know i have an expensive super fast router and I, I would imagine that this is not quite as fast if my phone is always connected to, to, to that instead but apart from that it's 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 really good uh i don't know if, if you guys had any had seen Wait, about did, this before did you articulate again so basically with this thing if i'm sitting here in new york and where are you sitting uh, right london now? All right, you're in London, I'm here in New York, that through that box, I could access your music through your Facebook page? No, you'd have to be here. I have to be there, okay. So, you, so essentially, if, if a friend of mine comes to my house, they want to access my Wi-Fi network, they would find this open access Wi-Fi that, like in a hotel, essentially, would bring up a Facebook login page, and if they log in through Facebook and they are my friend, the Wi-Fi, no the, the router knows that, and they can access the Wi-Fi without asking for passwords. Essentially, that's uh, okay. And they can control the music as well. They, they can play stuff on, on my Spotify, on my on my speakers. So yeah, it's it's, it's pretty neat. Uh, so it's got it's got like RCA out or like spit it out into your stereo. Is that what yes, it? exactly, exactly. Right. Uh, so yeah, we'll see what we'll see what happens. I would love to see something like Tomahawk how, plug into how this. Is that how is that different than? The current, you know, I don't remember what Apple calls it, but with iTunes, you can make your library available for people to, to listen to as well if they're on the same sort of network. How, how, what, what makes it unique and special? Uh, I'm, well, I'm missing something. I think this is essentially, it's a way to have a Sonos-like system, but without the speakers and uh, with the added bonus. Kind of, like, kind of like an AirPlay, right? Yeah, without, exactly. Without, without a TV, oh. without needing a TV. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. But okay. in, in a sense, it's different from AirPlay because I think AirPlay relies on the device to send the signal, right? Right. As far as I understand, whilst, for example, Sonos, if you play from the app into Sonos, it's the box that directly connects to the Spotify service and grabs the music from there. So this is similar in that sense. Uh, Got it. Because it, it essentially doesn't rely on Bluetooth and it doesn't make the connection messy, essentially, as far as I understand. Got it. All right. uh, Sorry, thank you. 
for explaining that. But no, it, I mean, it's, it's cool. I, I just wanted to talk about it because I had it here and it was a gadget, so why not? It is. <laughs> there, uh, Denmark uh, confirmed its status as digital forward territory as the Danish office of the IFPI released these figures uh, uh, that showcase that digital now represents 82% of all recorded music revenues in the in Denmark and streaming is 63% of all total revenues. So in that scenario, uh, uh, Jeff, I would imagine that uh, you'd be pretty terrified about the amount of money that uh, if that 10% uh, you know, <laughs> uh, rings through. It's uh, it's a lot of money that uh, it, it it it's um <laughs> it's an interesting rabbit hole of a conversation. But you know, picture this: you're a kid here in the United States. You've written a song, you record it, you go to TuneCore or, or CD Baby, you distribute it, it becomes available to stream in that territory. How are you getting your money? Yeah, right. Uh, the public because you need the right of public performance and the right of reproduction for a stream. Public performance can make it back if you're a member of ASCAP and BMI, but guess what? You're not getting your mechanical royalties. Right. It drives me, cra- drives me absolutely fucking crazy <laughs> it, it, and, and that there's no pipeline and they're just taking these people's money and it, goes, it actually goes into something called a black box and it gets given to Universal, EMI, Sony, the other large companies in that territory based on their market share. So congratulations, new music industry. You're subsidizing the old one. They know it. You don't. And there's no solution for that. Well, there will be, but it's going to take some time. Okay, uh, and, uh, <laughs> Jay, do you think that the U.S. is heading in this direction over the next uh, four or five years? I mean, we've been talking about this for maybe two or three years, right. saying that the, the Nordic countries are sort of the benchmark for uh, our access to music in the future, but people argue whether that's true or not, uh, considering uh, that people are stuck in the way, as, you know, in, in, in a, to a certain extent in different countries. You know, we've, we've seen Germany, for example, still uh, almost 70% uh, physical. So uh, what are your thoughts on how it's going to go in the US in the next uh, couple of years? I, I mean, you know, I'm, I've always thought that streaming is inevitable. Uh, I still think it's inevitable in terms of owning that market share, um, largely because it's easier. Yeah. And, and people gravitate to what's easier. Um, and so, yeah, uh, you know, I, I think it's taken longer than I would have thought, uh, you know, five years ago or, well, geez, when was it? 2007, when I worked on my first subscription music service, I thought, yeah. <laughs> oh, we're only like a year and a half away until this is really mean- mainstream. Uh, we're almost there now. We're like just getting to the point of like the very bleeding edge of being mainstream. Um, so yeah, it's, it's taken a sweet time, but uh, you know, it's definitely going to happen. It's definitely inevitable. Yeah. And uh, finally, I wanted to talk today about uh, something that happened in the UK, but I wanted to hear your thoughts from the US because it's quite an inter- interesting uh, a thing that happened is the fact that the government pledged to start a t- test a process where they're going to essentially rate uh, music videos uh, according to the same standards uh, as, as movies. Essentially, it's going to be uh, evaluated by the same board that uh, rates movies here in the UK, uh, and it's going to have a 12, 15 or 18 ra- age rating. Uh, essentially, video sites are going to have to add that sticker to the beginning of the video just to make sure that people know about it. It could be integrated in, on a technical side uh, uh, so that uh, if parents are, for example, don't want their kids to watch, uh, you know, 15 plus videos, uh, uh, they would be able to set the uh, their, their settings on, on their uh, parental controls on their computer to do, to do just that. And uh, it just seems like a really interesting thing because, you know, of course, there's thousands of music videos being released every month. And I just... Nobody really understand, understands how the UK government uh, thinks that this is going to be possible. This actually brought back uh, to me memories of my undergraduate uh, days. I don't know if you guys have ever seen this book, but this is uh, Tipper Gore's Rage, Raising PG, PG Kids in an X-Rated Society, uh, which I got from my dissertation when I did my undergraduate degree, and I did it on uh, US music censorship in the late 80s, which started with the, the Prince uh, uh, song and sort of went all the way to the uh, parental advisory sticker, which was actually spearheaded had it by Tipper Gore herself and this is actually signed it's amazing uh, I got it I got it I got it on Amazon and I think they probably sold about five copies so that's why I signed uh, <laughs> well, you know what if you, get, if you get Jello be offered to sign that as well you'll be that will be awesome <laughs> so uh, what do you guys think I and mean, for me it's crazy uh, do you think that uh, you know a Republican maybe <laughs> government well, right, in the US right, would ever sorry. think about doing this sorry for launching in but but explain to me how this could possibly, let's ignore the fact, the misinterpretation and the subjectivity of it. And look, I want to protect children as well. How the hell could this even work if the video comes up on the computer screen and the parent isn't there in the first place to see the advisory? How can they stop the child from watching it? I know. Well, you could, from your perspective, right, if you created Google accounts that had eight, well, like kid Google accounts, and then you could have a setting on a noob that would block the playback of anything that was rated above it. But, uh, you know, I think 
because I knew Nicki Minaj's video is going to have a lot of people talking about this. Yeah. Um, like whether it's technically feasible or not, I think you know it's 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 pushing a rock up a hill. But uh, I could certainly see here in the U.S. somebody uh, in Congress thinking, "Hey, I'm gonna I'm gonna push for this. This is going to be you know this could be a good platform for them." Uh, from a from a uh, political standpoint, so I would not be surprised to see something similar kind of start oh, dear percolating God. here. But yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> it's going to be an interesting. Yeah, the one. same the same senator that's masturbating to a dwarf porn site will be pushing. Under- <laughs> Sorry, I just- and on that note. <laughs> 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 oh, okay awesome well thanks so much guys and and all that note actually i'm gonna i'm gonna wrap up by saying the grace note as a new ceo which is all good as uh, a song called the australian music service is shutting down uh, due to the overcrowding of the australian music market and spotify updated its uh, windows phone app so you can enjoy the free uh, shuffle mode uh, like everybody else uh, could do about uh, nine months ago but uh, uh, there you go if you have a windows phone that's pretty great for you and uh, 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 once again check out audium.com and uh, get tomahawk.com and hey, also check out new youtube service man i'm excited about that since you're listing things that are coming yes of course of course uh, but we don't know anything about that so we'll see whether that comes <laughs> or not i mean we've been speculating about this for months it's been in the headlines on the show for such a long time but uh, yeah and and that's uh, that's that i think uh, uh, thanks so much again for joining me today guys it was a pleasure having you as always uh, and thanks so much for listening to the show you can find everything on digitalmusictrends.com uh, and follow through the links uh, uh, to all the different shows that we have and, and the events coverage and everything else uh, uh, i hope you really enjoy the site have a fantastic week and uh, till next time.